a uh, very long time coming uh, here on the show. Uh, we have the Godfather himself, Daniel Jeremiah, at, at the absolute pinnacle uh, of draft media. Finally got him here to do bootleg. And before we get started, DJ, uh, I want you to know personally, uh, you know, and we've known each other for a long time. Uh, as a, a very young intern, I was like 21 years old uh, when I first met you. I think it was back in 2012, you know, the old school Pat of the Draft days. Uh, and, you know, it was you and, and CD at the time. I was the, the czar of the magnet wall. I still have some of those magnets. I kept them. Uh, and, and you were instrumental uh, to my development in this whole industry, uh, behind the camera, in front of the camera. Uh, you've always been a massive inspiration. I mean, I want to thank you personally uh, for for how kind and, and how generous you were back then because you didn't have to be. You know, you were one of the faces of the network, one of the faces of NFL media, still are. Uh, and uh, you were, and you were incredibly kind. And, and I, I could not possibly thank you enough for that. And you're a big reason why I'm here today. Well, well, that's very nice of you to say. I'll, I'll say two things on that. Number one, my first recollection of our time together was we were at the Magnet Wall and we had uh, a we were doing the Houston Texans, and because two things you showed. Number one is that you're really smart and you you know football really well. But number two is you're really kind because we had as those magnets get you know you get going like we can get Charles and I at that time you can get hung out to dry if mm -hmm. something's not right right gosh they've already signed this free agent why is he playing left guard he should be playing right any but anyways you had it set up and and i think one of us charles and myself i can't remember had moved something around and then you just very politely said i think that they're gonna go with uh with this person uh, at outside linebacker and they'll probably and it was like totally 100 percent true i remember looking at going yeah that's absolutely correct and you saved us from looking really stupid but you didn't do it in like a young person like you dummies like what are you doing like we have to switch this guy to go over there but it showed that your 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 competence and it showed your kindness uh, that was my very first uh, recollection of you and then it's been so cool to sit on 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 my side of things and watch you just build you guys together have done a great job and the the uh, the platform you've built the content that you've put out um, I have watched, I've spent way too much time watching uh, content that you've produced and it's always very well thought out. It's, uh, it's done in a first class manner. It's just cool. I love seeing people that are good people that are smart and kind. And then you guys have just built your own universe. I love it. Well, if, if you ever need somebody to talk about Brooks Reed, I'm your guy, DJ. <laughs> it might have been Brooks Reed. It probably was. I swear it might have been. We might have had it Brooks Reed as an off-ball linebacker instead of, <laughs> instead of an edge guy. It probably was. He he His pulls from the past are incredibly accurate. But I had a very similar journey without ever meeting you. The first time I met you was actually the first time I met Brett was 2020 Senior Bowl. Um and but I'd watched your work for years before that, again, without ever having met you or talked to you. But I had the same level of inspiration because of the way you approach it. Not only you talked about smart people having smart content, but the how is really important. And I think that's what sort of separates people in this business is lots of people can talk about it and lots of people do. But the how and how it's organized and how it's made accessible. And I think you do a tremendous job of that. So similar similar thoughts from this end but uh i need to let you know we need to reset our list what do we you got? were the top of our list oh, like, oh yeah. sat yeah. down yeah. at yeah no literally in 2020 before we even said we were going to do anything bootleg wasn't even a thing yet we just met we were probably three days into knowing each other sitting at a bar in mobile we said so if we were going to do something who who would we get and you were the top of the list mina was right behind you and jordan was right behind her jordan reed and Jordan came on two years ago. We got Mina last year, and now we got you. So now we got to rewrite the list. Nice. Well, I'll give you. I'll give you the next one you can get. Is that you should have a Walt Anderson come on, and Brett can give him his hat back. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. First of all, first of all, Rob Lowe. He's oh, gonna. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I today's show, by the way, is, is kind of inspired by an interaction you and I had. Uh, I want to say it was 2014, might have been 2013, um, where uh, you know we we have this thing we do on the show where we do like the 10 gems list, and it's basically just guys that we really love watching. It doesn't have to be top 50. It's just guys. If we're gonna you know fall asleep at night, these are the highlights we're putting on before bed. And I remember. Um, around that time, you were talking about this young running back who you knew was going to go day three, and you were obsessed with this guy. You're like, I love, I never get an opportunity to talk about him, 
but I really want to talk about Devonta Freeman. And <laughs> of course, Devonta Freeman ended up being Devonta Freeman. And I, I still remember uh, you regretting not talking about him more because you loved him so much, even though you knew it wasn't going to be a high pick. So today is all about Daniel Jeremiah's gems. Uh, just a few guys that, again, maybe you've never even got to talk about them. If you had to talk about any of those types of players, uh, what's your first one? Okay, well, first of all, that brought up jogging my memory because that's a good one. There's always plenty of uh, guys every year where I'm like, oh man, this is my guy. Like, I don't even, I don't even know who will remember this, but there was the tight end um, who who had little to no production, but was had was unbelievable on special teams. It was O'Shaughnessy. You remember? You remember him, Dan, Dan O'Shaughnessy? Dan O'Shaughnessy. Yes. There you go. Yeah. I can't even remember the school, but I remember forcing like because i would i used to stay up in la for the path run so I, I would have to be in studio a bunch of days so i would stay up there so in the evenings all the guys would be prepping like maloney and all these guys who produced the draft would be sitting there prepping to get ready for the draft and i would just be sitting in a cubicle just grinding tape and and they're it's so annoyed with me because i'm like you gotta watch this guy so they come over excited and i'm showing them like <laughs> o'shaughnessy covering kicks in, in college and they're just like what are you doing i'm like we've reached that point of the process but that was like my guy uh during that time but i'll i'll pull up i'll pull up my list here so i just so you know kind of like behind the curtain um i put everything the key to being able to do this um for me at least is just being organized with everything in excel so then when i'm on mm -hmm. the draft coverage i've got my computer in front of me um on my excel sheet i'll have 400 players and i'll have it sorted by my top 150 at that point in time and then all the guys underneath that by position but then i have a tab that has it by position i have a tab that has it by school um, i have every tab of the updates that i've done along the way with these guys and then it, what i have if you want to just have a visual of it it's the position the name the school the uh the height weight speed the grade that I gave him, um, where he is in terms of the overall rank, where he is in a positional rank, and then where he is, in, or then my notes on him, which I've condensed down to fit into uh, that Excel sheet. But that's how I can, you know, I don't have all this stuff in the top of my head, so I got to, I have to consult that list. But if I'm looking at it, um, some guys that I that I really really like that are kind of outside that top group. Um, I mean. I don't know. Malachi Corley is definitely a name that everybody's familiar with mm -hmm. from Western Kentucky. He's somebody that's in the bottom end of my top 50, but like stamping him like with the, I would use it like my Raven stamp almost. We used to call mm -hmm. him kind of like those red star players. Like that guy is just so angry and mean with the ball in his hands that like, I cannot wait to see where he goes. And I would, I, I was talking about this with Bucky uh, earlier today. Like if you have the, the blueprint for a young quarterback, I want to bake in, I want to bake in as many easy completions as I can, whether that's with the tight end, the back, or whether that's with a slot receiver that I can just bake in easies. Like Malachi Corley is going to bake in easy completions for whatever quarterback he goes to. If you were in a room, would the new kickoff rule bump him up for you? Yes. There's a couple guys like that. I think like Cooper DeGene is going to get a little bump um, from the new kickoff rule. And it's, it's, it's interesting because... I remember having a conversation last year with the GM and we were talking, comparing two players. And I said, well, um, I would go this guy over that guy just to return value. I'll give him the nod. And he's like, there's no such thing as return value anymore. And, uh, mm. and I, it kind of like, like stood up and I'm like, I'm sure that's probably was impetus behind this rule getting changed. It's like, that's taken something out of the game. And now I think you can kind of reinsert it. Although I think there's maybe a little different skill set, maybe more of a, like a running back skill set for that position and that's i mean malachi corley's a running back with the ball in his hands so i like that one yeah he brings something to the wide receiver position that a lot of wide receivers don't these days which is mass he's not the tallest guy but he's 215 built like a rock he's got good contact balance definitely i could see that more running back type skill set and i agree with you with the new kickoff rules looking for a guy that's got one cut and go ability that's what it's going to take in close quarters and those guys are going to get priority no, he's he's a fun one, man. And to me, it's just it, you can't go wrong when you just go with competitive players. I mean, when you, you know, they're gonna those guys find a way. They're gonna make an impact in whatever way that they can. But you don't, you really just totally whiff on one of those. So that would be one um, from the receiver position. If I want to go to the running back position, let's go over there. Let's see what we got here uh, from a grade standpoint. Well, I'm a Bucky Irving guy, so. Um, Talk about that for a second, because the guy up in the corner up there, he, he's not so hot on Bucky. So, so no, this is a good point, because tough. people are split on him. 
So here's my here's my comparison with him is Devin Singletary. Devin Singletary had a lot of Ooh. those same attributes and same skills coming out. <laughs> Devin Singletary ran in the low four sixes. See, you're, you're you're going after my Texans heart you're, here. You're you know? killing him because you're taking a guy he doesn't like and compare him to a guy he does. I love this. This is the best. Unplanned, oh. unplanned. But no, I just to me, I think I know exactly what he is. Like I know what role he's going to serve. I know what he's going to do for me. He can catch the crap out of it. He can make you miss. Um, he's just he's never going to be the featured guy. But I think when you have him in his proper role and put that in context and where he's going to go because he didn't run fast. Um, I mean, I think Singletary, Singletary is one. I'm a, Singletary is in my top fifty. And then when he wet the bed with the forty, I wimped out and dropped him down. Um, and then what do you go third round? I think he ended up going in the somewhere around there. Yeah. yeah. Now Bucky Irving, you're probably going to get a discount on that. You might get him in the you know fourth, fifth round when it's all said and done. Stack him up with all these running backs. So I just think for the value of where he's picking, I know he has a defined role, and that's where I find the value. A uh, lot of tell me why you hate him, Brett. This... Go ahead. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a counterpoint. Not worst player ever. It's just we. Have we ever seen somebody at his size, speed, explosiveness profile work? And that, that's what's really tough for me, right? Is because I, I even feel like if we're looking at like relative athletic score and everything like that, like. God, he's he's a guy where am I am I trusting the data? Am I trusting my eyes? And maybe that's the point in the draft where where you're you're trusting your heart more than anything. Is there? I mean, you have experience with this. Is there a point in the draft where you're in the room and you're and you just start picking with your heart or your gut more so than following analytics or, or your eyes? No, I think analytics plays. I'd be curious to see. I, I don't. I can I can pull it up in just a minute. But like, what was Ky- I know? Kyron Williams didn't run well at all. Um, he was a lot bigger, though. <laughs> what year? Get what year? Now we're gonna go. We're doing real time investigation here. Kyron Williams uh, was twenty three or twenty two. Uh, he was twenty two, I believe. Yeah, he was at least twenty two, maybe twenty one. All right, hold on. I also think this is like this an is, exact this is conversation fun for me. that me and EJ had. because I was I was a Kyron Williams guy. Brett was not. I'm a Bucky Irving guy. He again doesn't hate him, but he's like, I just don't know. I can't. I can't quite get over the hump with him. Uh, well, Kyron Williams. Great. All right, you ready? Hold on. I'm gonna write this down so I can get the. If I want the effect of this. Hold on. Okay. All right. <laughs> One of the fun things you mentioned about competitiveness, DJ. Uh, when I was at Oregon's pro day, got to see Bucky up close and just watching in that environment with all his teammates, and he is that guy. He is the spark plug guy. He is the loud guy. He is the guy letting you know that he made the catch or didn't make the catch, letting the other guys know when they made a catch from across the you know practice bubble. He is a he is all go all the time on the field, and you're going to get that element with him. He is going to he's going to take every carry for everything it's worth. All right, I had to make sure. I wanted to write, I didn't want to be looking at my screen because I want to see Brett's face when we do it. I didn't want to be staring at this. All right, all right. Hit, hit me with the killing blow here. So, uh, Bucky Irving. The aforementioned Bucky Irving, 5090, 192, 455. Kyron, Willing, Kyron Williams, Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl or Kyron Williams, I think is what we probably should. All, all pro, <laughs> Kyron Williams. All pro, 5092, so a quarter of an inch bigger, 194, two pounds heavier, 465, slower. Was Kyron sub 200? <laughs> he was 194. Isn't he like 212 now? Oh Damn. no! Oh, you know, since the movie ended, they went back and. Ch- <laughs> hey man, I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, if if we can do if we can do like a 1980s uh, ski movie montage where we're getting Bucky Irving up to 205 in one off season, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what. Have have the Chargers take him, send him to Ben Herbert because we know Ben Herbert can add weight. I'll feel a lot better about it. Yeah, see, we're gonna we're gonna make him tough to break. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make him tough to break. Now, but to me, like you're gonna look up next year and bucky irving and we can you can replay this you can post this and throw it back in my face when it if it doesn't happen but like he is the classic he's going to have 400 yards rushing he's going to have uh you know he's going to have 50 catches like he's going to just he's going to be a piece he's not the he's not the main piece of the puzzle but he's going to have a role and he's going to be an effective piece of a team uh compared to eckler coming out eckler stronger Okay. Eckler's more compact, just stronger, physically stronger, pulling through tackles, different things like that. Bucky's more likely to make you miss. 
But Bucky, one of the things about him, and to me, we talk about speed with running backs, is like to me, he doesn't have to gear down to make you miss. I, if you're four three and you've got to completely gear down to change directions and make people miss in space, he makes people miss at the third level without gearing down. Like he's got kind of that slippery, slithery, make you miss stuff, uh, which I like. Are are there uh, in terms of actually? Let me stick with Oregon. I want to get your opinion on this because EJ and I are also split on this player too. It happens with Oregon players for us. Uh, Troy Franklin, yay or nay? I like Troy Franklin more than my friends in the league like Troy Franklin. But I again, I know I feel like I know exactly who he is and what he is. Um, he is just a, he's going to be your vertical stretch player. I wish he was stronger. I wish he was more physical. That's not who he is. Um, but I feel like I kind of. You know the comp. I, I didn't even. I didn't use this for my comp, but the one I was thinking of. Uh, Still, what was? Uh, why am I blanking on his first name? Kenny Stills. Ken, Kenny Stills. Kenny Stills. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, roughly the same size. Yeah. Pure, pure. You know, vertical. Go get it. Yep. You can go go over the top. So that's actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that for the draft. So thanks for <laughs> there you that, go uh, for that thought process. But you know, I we have a friend and maybe a mutual friend who's going to be. Uh, I don't, I don't, He's a really he was a great player in the NFL. I'll just leave it at that. It's his favorite. Okay. He's his, that's his favorite receiver in the draft. It's Troy Franklin. Really? Troy Franklin? But then swear to you. And then when I talk okay. to teams, teams are not as are not yeah. as high on him. So there you go. I have him. I different. think he'll go in the two. I think he'll go late too. Is my guess. I think he'll go mid to late too. Yeah. Wow. Uh, EJ and I had a. a I don't want to say a disagreement. We we saw this player very differently in terms of position. Okay. And EJ knows who I'm talking about. Aeneas Smith. Maybe. Running back or receiver? Yeah, returner. That's going to help him. The new rules are going to help him as a returner. He is built, he is every bit built like a running back who plays receiver. But to me, like his, I don't know how much downfield stuff I'm going to get out of him as much as I'm going to just get the ball in his hands. Like, I always hate the poor man, rich man, but like he's a poor man's Percy Harvin is who he is. Like he's let's <laughs> just flip him, flip him the ball, get him the ball, and let him just kind of do something with the ball. I, I don't think he's quite as good in terms of just you know stemming guys, you know snapping guys off route wise. I don't think he has that polish yet. But he's pretty darn good with the ball in his hands, and he's pretty darn good at getting the ball in his hands. I would completely agree with you about the routes. We know about the physical prowess. We saw a lot of that throughout his time at Texas A&M, regardless of where he was playing, because once he catches it, he runs like a running back. Mm -hmm. The thing for me that really sort of moved that needle towards wide receiver is his hands are so good. He had not great quarterbacking. His drop percentage was 1.9 even with the guys that were throwing to him. And it was not particularly pretty, especially this year. He caught everything. I'd have to go back through my notes on him because I'm, I'm – uh, let me just go back. And pull. Yeah, he doesn't have the, he doesn't have the route pouch. You're absolutely right talking about the stem and beating guys there. That's not how he's going to beat guys. But if you put the ball anywhere near him on short to medium stuff, A, he's going to catch it. B, he turns into a very dangerous running back as soon as he does. Yeah, so I've got excellent returner slot. He's quick. He's tough. Um, flashes flashes some head nod polish. I thought he let the ball get into it. He didn't drop it, but I thought he let some balls get into his body. He can really make you miss. The thing that I – like the grade that I gave him, which is a 6-0 grade, which puts him more kind of in that – really kind of like the fifth round, like fourth, fifth round, like in that area, is because mm-hmm. to me, if I've got a guy that I'm projecting to the slot – to me, uh, feel like zone, feel awareness, right. those things. I didn't, I didn't see that at the level that I wanted to see it of just the comfortability of just being able to work and, and find soft spots and zones. Like that's what, that's how you make your living in there. Um, but I love the run after catch stuff and everything he does with the ball in his hands. Would you bump him up around if I told you he was going to play for Mike McDaniel? Wow, you could say player X going. To yeah, play. exactly. They would, they, would all get, they would all get the bump up at that point in time. There's always, and I think I think I told Brett, maybe I told you this before in the past, but like our running joke in the draft room when I was in Baltimore was just like, uh, like we, you'd see so many crappy offensive linemen and you'd kill them and then they'd get drafted by the Colts and you yep. just like, frack. <laughs> Howard Mudd. Howard Mudd's going to make him like a decent uh-huh. player and Peyton Manning's going to get the ball out so fast and then like Kyle Devan was a great example of that gave him a free yeah. agent grade 
He couldn't play for us in Baltimore. There's no way. He can't play for us. And then he starts for a zillion years for the Colts. And he'd be like, well, you really missed on Kyle Devan. I'm like, did I? He went to the he went to Peyton Manning in the Colts. Like that's what that got me. Uh, but that was the worst. You never want to see a guy go there. And you never wanted to see a guy that you kind of crushed, but was a good special teams player go to New England because you're like, he'll roster this guy for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's gonna be around forever. And he'll make a Pro Bowl. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> make a Pro Bowl. <laughs> that happened with uh with Kyle Hamilton, where it, you know, uh, when when I was watching Kyle Hamilton he was coming out, I was like, okay, he would be very very good in a specific role and i worry if he goes to a team that's going to try to make him something that he's not right it, it, I, I hope somebody doesn't try to make him eddie jackson when he's not eddie jackson and it, you know baltimore picks him up we're like yeah they're going to use him right <laughs> and, and now he's kyle hamilton you know yeah i think there's guys like that every single year um let me look i'll i'll, I'll just go through and grab grab one of them here um like to me like edrin cooper is a good example of that like if you're gonna if you're gonna ask if you're gonna ask Edrin Cooper to kind of play in the in the mud, you know, to mm-hmm. sort to sort constantly and to be in the middle of all that, to be the green dot, to be directing traffic, like I don't think you're gonna like as much as what you get there. To me, you pair him up though, you pair him up with that traditional Mike, and then you let him run and hit and, and see and go like you have a mission you have a mission before the snap starts and you carry it out once the ball gets snapped that to me like you'll see him do great but if you're asking him to kind of sort through everything in there like i think you'll be disappointed I mean, he told us that himself we asked him if he prefers yeah. mike or will and he's like i <laughs> put me at will let me run and go hey, really? like even yeah. yeah even he says he's like yeah. even if they even if they <laughs> are are uh, being, they would be dishonest with you and say, well, I think uh-huh. that's what he wants to hear, that I want to be the mic, the alpha, sure. the signal caller, the green dot. The good awareness on his part, that's what he is. I mean, yeah. he is a run-and-hit machine. Yeah. In space, he really understands that he can be more impactful. He knows he can do the other, and when we talk to him about it, yeah, but you get that feeling, and I love that idea of asking that. It's like... Um, guards who are moving to center i don't ask them if they can especially not at an all-star game because it's a job interview they're all going to say yeah i can i ask them if they love it and like when i asked um uh mace right mason yeah it was mason yes mccormick because they had him snapping at shrine and he had been you know hardcore left guard for all of his time at only at, 57 uh, starts worth but yeah yeah only 57 yeah. starts <laughs> almost past Bo Nix, but not quite <laughs> and he lit right up and he said no i love it i i think it's great because some guys don't want that extra responsibility they just want to go hit guys in the mouth but he he loves the mental part of that and come to find out uh the center was younger than he and garrett he and garrett played together on the left side when the center came in who's also good he's going to get drafted uh but when he came in he was younger and actually they had mace make the calls from left guard interesting and i was like oh so you've already done it before you actually moved over and took you know the responsibility you talk about the green dot so when you find guys like that that light up and say no no this is really cool i think this is something I want oh to self-awareness do. too man yeah. just like let's go yeah what well, here i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback on that because i'm this is a subject that i'm passionate about is people always say what's the point of the combine interview or the all-star game mm-hmm. interview like what are you going to get out of it these guys have just gonna they've been trained you're going to get canned answers and i think there are ways to navigate around some of those what's your when you've got a chance to talk with these guys as they're leading up into the process give me like one some of your favorite questions that you think elicit a decent answer you can do something Ooh. with Ooh, we always ask them, uh, you know, what other sports they played growing up, uh, you know, what they liked about those sports. Uh, EJ's got a great question where we ask them because we, we say, oh, you're the best scouts in your program. Who's coming up? Mm-hmm. And you can you can kind of tell a lot about how plugged into the room they are with how they talk about the guys they play with, both on offense and on defense on their team. And there's there's a noticeable pattern where the guys that we talk to who are captains ha- have that question or handle that question really well. Um, there's a, a question we introduced uh, for quarterbacks this year. We had, uh, Jordan Travis gave a great answer. Uh, you know, what's the best um, lesson from the time you started in college to the time you finished? What's the best lesson you learned uh, about how to be a better leader? And, you know, it, they, again, you get a whole bunch of different answers, but just based on on how they answer those types of questions where they're not, they're not talking about themselves, um, yep. 
you can you can really get a sense about how they might fit into a room and i, I love that kind of stuff and i love when ej asks it because it, it always produces good results so so you're with, ej you're with uh you're you're share the same opinion right like you can get something out of these like you it's can. not all hand yeah no it is and we have absolutely had experience on both sides of that wall and the guys that are super well trained uh, you think of it as pr training you can tell they come off as as very formulaic and sometimes you can get them to sort of sort of break that down and, and crack and be open and a lot of these guys look they're coming to protect themselves this is a this is a professional job interview right they don't know us from anybody so the the way that we started which was completely by accident uh mostly because we didn't have our act together at the first shrine pool we went to because we didn't know what we were doing we just said hey hey come here come here i want to show you something and we would show them some of their tape and they would just be like leaning on the table before we started the camera and we'd be like why'd you do this like and they're like are we recording well, no not yet i just wanted to get your opinion because i saw this and i thought it was really cool and all of a sudden they're talking ball and they just you see their shoulders drop and they're like, no, no, I took this guy like this is the read. This is what we call it. You know, normally I would have done this, but I did this. And, it's, and they're like, OK, cool. All right. Sit down. We'll get started. Right. And they're like, wait, what? Oh, OK, cool. And they're like, these guys know ball and we'd get a lot more out of them. Um, one of the other questions that works really well for us is asking them about their teammates who are at the game with them. So if there's multiple guys from a school at a game, hey, give me the scouting report for, you know, all the Florida State guys were at Shrine this year. And we sat down with Jerry and Nardo and all those guys. And it's like, all right, well, tell me about Jordan. Tell me about, you know, tell me about Renardo. Tell me about uh, Love It. Tell me about, you know, and you can tell, again, like Brett said, how much they pay attention, how much they're aware of what other guys on their side of the ball are doing, how much they watch when they're on the sidelines to see guys who are playing on the you know, the opposite side of the ball. And you can really get an idea. And then some guys, look, some guys are really shy. Some guys come in. Some guys are really polished. Uh, there was one guy this year um, at Shrine that, it, nice guy, good answers, but like extremely polished, sort of right down the middle. And we got done and I said, man, that's that's kind of the most polished guy we've seen this year that we're, we really didn't feel like we got a lot out of him. And I was talking to somebody else and they said, oh, his dad's his dad's an author. Yeah. Like <laughs> his dad's his dad's been training him to do this since whatever. He goes on book tours and whatever else. And so, like, he's been watching it since he was 10 or 12. Like, I was like, oh, makes sense. But you even get that. Like, you know, what kind of environment was he raised in? From that. Yeah. Yeah. Learned every something. every bit. So it's it's super fun to dig around the edges and to see what works and what doesn't. And we treat it like a lab. If something doesn't work, if a question just uh, I used to ask, um, here's one that I dropped. Uh, I would ask who really gave you problems and guys don't like that. And it puts them in a weird spot in an all-star game to say, oh, blank kick my butt. Like, yeah, yeah. so you have to you we can ask that. And we've sort of workshop ways to ask that question without because guys would like nobody gave me a hard time. I remember the first time it was a lineman that went to the Raiders from Tennessee and he was like, uh, uh no, nobody. Yeah. Nobody ever like, gave me problems. Uh, okay, like, okay, well, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> and then I brought up a guy who I knew gave him problem, uh, and it turned out this was just bad to worse. This was frying pan to fire. Uh, he hated that dude, and he wouldn't even name him. He was like, that dude, that dude you're talking about, he's dirty. And I was like, oh, great. Now we've gone to the completely wrong place. <laughs> really got him going. But it's funny, like a couple of different things there that you said. One yeah. is – I have a, one of my good friends, the defensive line coach, and he likes when you're in the combine interview, him, he likes to see the body language when they transition from the background to the tape. Because you go into the room mm -hmm. as a player, most of them are the same. You're going to go yes. in there, hit you on the background information that they need, any character stuff or any, you know, anything, you know, academically you had an issue, whatever. They hit all that stuff and then they transition to hand it off to the coach, put the tape on and go. And he says, you'll see guys who they'll be like this, right? They'll be like this and then like, the tape comes on and you see them like they kind of like get up on the edge of their chair and they're like, oh, like this guy is excited to talk football now. Like this yeah. is, you know, you can see a change in their demeanor. So that's one. The the questions I'll give you guys that I that uh, that I've over the years, I thought elicited a, a good response. A couple things. Number one is um, give me your routine. So can you walk me through your routine? After, the game ends Saturday at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. Tell me, walk me through your week. And explain to me because it's one thing to say guys are passionate guys love football guys are professional like this is a great way to get to that not i watch a little tape no 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 no. like what what time do you get up 
what's your what you what are you accomplishing on all these different days and i don't necessarily care i don't want to know what you're required to do like what you guys have a lift at 6 a.m don't care you guys have your practice from this time to this time how do you manage your time and your free time there give me your schedule and and if i was with a team and i've talked to teams about this and and they've done it which is i would request hey if you don't have that you know if you do you have it with you do you have it like in a journal do you have do you keep track of information what do you have you know how do you study tape to me like i watch tape i would i want to know well what do you what do you write down yeah you're a corner mm-hmm. so you tell me you watch extra tape every tuesday night what are you watching one and what are you writing down and then the, after that follow-up would be can you take a picture of your notebook and text it to me because i want to mm-hmm. see you played wow. West Virginia week three. Take a picture of your West Virginia notes and send them to me. You might not hear from the guy again. Or the guy's so dialed in, he's like, ah, no problem. Open book. He sends you six pages of notes, yeah. and you're yeah. like, okay, like I, let's I, go. So I talked to Terry and Arnold on the phone, and I said, um, same thing. So you walk me through your routine. Talked about how he takes all these notes and pages of notes. And I said, well, give me an example. Like, what do you write in your notebook? And he goes, well, we're getting ready to play Kentucky. And I knew based off splits and based off down and distance that I was most likely to get an out cut from you watching on tape. I undercut it and he picked it. And he had, he had laid, he'd kind of laid it out in more detail than that, but just kind of set everything up. And then that was from what he learned on this day of the week when he was watching the third down cut ups and he was studying splits and, and different things like that. I'm like, well, that's. That's one thing to say. Oh, I love football on a scale of one to ten. I'm an eleven. Like, what do I do with that? That doesn't help. You got to love football to do that, though. But when you tell me that and you give me the detail of which led to your production, like I'm, I'm in on that. There, I, there's a, a bunch of Michigan players that I think qualify for that kind of statement this year. Uh, you've gotten to talk to Sainer still, right? I have not. I've I've I know plenty about him, and I've seen a bunch of conversations with him, but I've never one on one had a conversation with him. I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be that kind of guy, right? Because you're. I mean, you're flipping from receiver to DB, let alone nickel. His nickname. Hardest. His nickname. It, it was the CEO. Uh, I think he was yeah. looking at Echoes in Dallas, and they just called him the CEO. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. He's that kind of guy. Dadrian Taylor Demerson. I mean, I, not that the Bears need him that bad, but we got done with that interview, and EJ's like, oh, my God, please give me, give me, give me. Like, and you talk to anybody from Lubbock or within 100 miles of Lubbock, they would die for that kid. Like, they, he's he's an incredible leader. Like, I had people um, reach out to me uh, that were uh, around the Texas Tech program um, that had been around, you know, like, you know, you know, you heard the stories about, like, Jamal Adams coming out of LSU. They're like, he's that. He's that kind of kind of leader and when we're when we're sitting around and and we're asking these guys at at bowl games um when we hear like the same name come up about five times from kind of like rabbit taylor demerson did uh just about like how they control the room with these guys that they've known for three days we take notice that that kind of stuff matters right um did anybody pop, uh, you know, down in Mobile this year for you in terms of somebody who like very clearly took control of the room like immediately? Well, I mean, look, I mean, it's not a secret. Like Q Mitchell went down there and took over the whole week. You know, Quinion Mitchell was he just he arrived with business to get accomplished and he handled his business and to the point where, you know, Mike Tomlin had challenged him after the first day and said, "Hey, look, Roman Wilson's the best receiver that in that in your group through the first day." Like. He, every time he steps to the line, you should be at, at the front of the line going against him. And he did. He matched him the whole next day. Every single rep, they went together, which spoke about both kids, really. Um, sure. But a lot but a lot about Quinion. So that, to me, was one that, that, that jumped out. I think Fisk and Nagy's told the story, too, on that with him switching teams and all that. He kind of got put in a tough spot there because they had some attrition in the game. Um, and handled himself, you know, handled himself really, really well. But the, the other one in terms of, like, the interview stuff, um, I was told that Bullard was awesome from uh, yeah, from Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, so Bullard went in and uh, in one of his meetings, like they have they have the tape on a on a uh, it's frozen, right? So you go through all the other stuff, and then we're going to start the tape. He goes, so all you can see is this. And I'm sure it's they're at the line of scrimmage. I, I'm guessing it's he must have had the scoreboard bug. So I'm guessing it's the scoreboard bug. You can't see the play, but you can see the scoreboard. 
and then it's going to flip to the play. So they start it, and he goes, all right, yeah, this third and seven, they're going to run this. We had this call. We had this check. But on first down, they ran this. On second down, they ran that. And that's why they were in this <laughs> third down. He knew the whole sequence that led up to the play they were getting ready to show and, li- and listed it all out. He said, we haven't even got through the play yet. And we're like, what are we even watching tape for this guy? Like, we're, we're good. <laughs> that's he's, amazing. He's and loaded. That's unreal. <laughs> that's like play, McVay. You don't play at Georgia at that as a freshman. You don't play there. Like that went like he did, unless you are rock solid up here. Wow. Wow. That's insane. Especially, you know, you're putting in, you know, well, not all the time, full-time work as a student, but like, you know, you're doing, you're doing school stuff in addition to doing football. I mean, to be that dialed in, that is uh, how many, how many times have we seen guys go to the NFL and say it's easier because they have more time to do it. Yeah. Those guys (laughs) that, that forced their way, like those are, I guess maybe Ohio state would be the third, um, those three mm-hmm. programs to me, like you play as a freshman, like there, with I mean, with the dudes you have to climb over to get onto the field, like that's, I, I give you a little bonus point for that. Um, this time of year, pro days are done unless you're Cooper Jean or Johnny Newton, anything yeah. like that. Um, reports ideally are done. As a scout, what are they doing right now to get ready? Like what? What is? What is? Give me the routine. To steal your question, give me the routine for a scout this time of year. So it's different every team. There's a lot of teams right now that are on next year. So like if you're an area scout, this is to bed. You've got your reports in. You've had your meetings. You've said your piece. You're on to watching next year's guys. Yeah, like there's a section of teams which kind of sucks. Like because it's like you don't even get a chance to like enjoy the fruits of your labor to like be in part of, of the process all the way to the finish line. And that's changed. When I, you know, when I first started, I would say the majority of the teams, the vast majority, darn near all of them, the scouts were involved all the way to the to the end, like to the point where it's meetings. You know, the week of the draft, you're in the draft room or you're adjacent to the draft room. You're you're locked in. I would say now the the paranoia, and I think social media probably is a big part of that. But just their teams do not want any information getting out. It is such a tight circle to the point where. You know, we can go back to like the Trubisky thing where they had uh, mm-hmm. um, what's his name, Glennon, uh, uh, you know, at their draft party, and they had oh to, like, yeah, yeah. You remember that? Because nobody yeah. knew. Like there was only like the head coach and the GM, and only two people that knew what they were going to do. Um, so information gets very tight. The circle gets very small. Um, but for the teams that still do it kind of the old school way, um, like say you're picking, say you're picking ten, you're the Jets. Uh, all that you've done all your area you've done all your cross checks for position that you were assigned and then at this point in time they know okay look these you know we're not going to take the quarterbacks so take the three quarterbacks out of the mix um, we'll assume you know we can assume that you know Harrison's going to be gone right let's just just take one name for example we know our pick is going to come from one of these five players like one of these five guys or six guys so every scout in the room they we would write the names up on the board of the six names any of these guys you haven't done yet either from your from your area or as your cross check you're doing them and then we would go through you know the really would probably be this week they would have already been assigned and meetings are going on this week you would come in there and we would spend half of the day just talking about those players and anybody who had just done a new report who hadn't had a chance to say his piece would say his piece and we would have like hash it out this is this is it this is our decision we need to get these five guys in the proper order um and that's going to help inform our decision and uh, and what we're going to do so that that was here at this point in time i would always get like howie roseman is um he's always like he's pretty good about where he is at this point in the process for like the top of the draft but he might send you might get an email right now it says hey we want to take an interior lineman in the sixth round you know we have two six round picks here's six guys i know you these guys weren't in your area you didn't have to just watch these six guys and stack them and send them to me so like these little one-off like little little projects mm-hmm. and stuff like that that's kind of the stuff that's going on now yeah and and of course they've had to go to georgia too <laughs> yeah exactly exactly. dude kelsey was one of those kelsey that was why i was thinking of that because that was 
a clump of uh, interior offensive linemen that year that were like, hey, these are – was just day two then because we only had two days of the draft. But these are guys that are probably fifth, sixth, seventh round. Like who – you know, let's look at – you know, let's try and nail one of those guys. And we notoriously missed on Danny Watkins in the first round and then drafted a Hall of Fame center uh, in Kelsey, you know, towards the end of the draft. So that's the draft in a nutshell. <laughs> you got to find them. They're down late. Takes work. I had a little flash of that on Saturday. I was uh, driving with my buddy, and we were driving past the University of Texas practice fields, and there's Arch Manning and three full fields of guys and tape going, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is already, you know, we're on to 2025 at this point. So, yeah, have you guys have you guys done – I have. I, I always get asked about that. I'm like, I, right no. now with all these names in my head, I couldn't tell you five guys in next year's draft. Not even a no. The only guys that are like that, and uh, there's one in this draft, and it was Johnny Newton, and it was last year when you were watching that Illinois defense over and over and over again, and you, get, you just kept getting your eyes pulled to you, and it was like, okay, I give up. Like Johnny Newton's coming next year, just get ready. I think I put out a tweet to that effect, of, you know, probably about two weeks ago this time last year. I was like, nope, <laughs> this is the guy. Even with all these other guys that are killers and are going to get drafted really high and look great. This is the guy. Just mark it down. He's coming. But did you even know his name? Like, because like right now, I can tell you just from all. I'm like, well, Michigan's got a freak show tight end. Don't know his name, but I saw him on everybody that I watched. Killed all of them. I know yep. LSU's got a left tackle. Uh, like, like just yeah. those. Things. It's random. Like, it's names random are guys. nowhere. I got no. Oh, clue th- this is this. <laughs> no. This is going to sound stupid, but it's also very on brand for us. Uh, South Dakota State's got a center. <laughs> EJ, it's coming out next year. <laughs> I it's know. really good. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's it is funny when you see those guys and occasionally, you know, I think when we're all doing this, we occasionally sometimes we get glazed and we just check. We'll send a guy a piece of tape and be like, am I nuts or is this guy that's like 290 and playing center, like kicking everybody's tail? It's like, I don't know. He looks pretty good. I'll, I'll you know, I'll put a note in. But that's it. It's uh, it reminds me of teachers, right? Teachers in like grade school who get, you know, they have or even worse, like middle school. You've got seven periods of 35 kids. Right. And they're like, oh, do you know next year's kids names? And they're like, No, I don't know all this year's kids names. I get people ask me like. Once this, once it's over and I can decompress, then I'm pretty good about names of like we can go back however far you want to go back, and mm-hmm. you can mention a school player. I give you the name, and I I pretty good with that. But during this like uh, run up and this like sprint, like you asked me who did this team take in the first round last year, and I'm like, oh gosh, ah. last year like I, I, who uh, who was that? You know, yeah. Um, it's just Gosh. all it's all jammed in. It's like cramming for the final. Yep. Your yeah. short term gets flushed for you sure. Can flush it all out. Yeah. Uh, this time of year, it's like I don't know. Send an email to Bill. <laughs> Bill, yeah, look yeah. it up. He'll tell you exactly what you need. <laughs> yes, yes. I've got Jack and Bill. We Smith. leaned on him. <laughs> they can help me out with that stuff. Uh, I I couldn't let you go without you know talking about the team who we mutually work with, uh, the LA Chargers. Who, when you and I talked weeks ago, at this point. We, we were in agreement, like offensive line, corner. Yeah. If they're going to take anything high, that's it because they need it. But more likely, they trade down because, uh, honestly, their number one need is a volume of cheap talent. Like, that is what they need. They have a, a, a head coach now who is uh, uniquely advantaged in the sense that he knows all these kids. He recruited all these kids. Hopefully, you know, early 2010s Pete Carroll, this thing, right? And then Keenan got traded. And now I don't know. Uh, where are you at with the fifth overall pick? Let's say quarterbacks go one through four. Marvin's sitting on the board. Are they taking Marvin or are they calling up Ryan Poles and saying, hey, what do you give us? Yeah, I'm, to me, I still think trade out is the way to go. I mean, if you're you know looking at the way you mentioned it and look, when you've, you've paid the quarterback, it's part of the deal, right? You've got to maximize every dollar, maximize every opportunity you have to build talent around the quarterback because it's a big chunk of your of your money. The Chiefs done it as, you know, they're the poster child for how they've done that. They've maximized all these different picks. So I would imagine Joe Ortiz is just praying that that phone rings. If it doesn't ring, now you've got a decision to make because – it, I, I was talking to somebody about this uh, yesterday, and I said, this is going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. Because when it was, do you remember the Bengals, the Sewell, um, Jamar yes. Chase debate, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Everybody was strong on that. And then I, my thing was, I'm a simpleton. 
just I'm gonna take the highest rated player. Who's the best player? To me, with Jamar Chase was a better player coming out than Penny Sewell. So I would stick with the receiver. Not gonna get too hung up on positional value, what have you. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. And obviously they go to a Super Bowl. That's the the pro side. Then Burroughs got hurt. That's the you know that's the downside. Mm-hmm. You can still are people are still in their trenches on that one uh, <laughs> uh, on which way they should have gone with that pick. But I've gone from saying best player available, and I think in most situations with a normal team, normal head coach, normal history of your organization, I would say absolutely. I have a higher grade on Marvin Harrison than I do on Joe Alt. Um, but with this one, with Harbaugh coming in. Joe Ortiz coming in, culture, identity, a team that's been, quote, unquote, a finesse team for as long as I can remember. I've been calling their games for six years. They haven't really been a physical team. You're trying to change all that. Yep. I just think, man, and I, and I get, trust me, the Charger fans, and they get mad at me, and I'm supposed to be their guy, call the games now, you know, all these years. And they're like, why? You, they, why? They need a receiver so <laughs> bad. And I'm like, I know, but this is not the only round in the draft. Yep. And the receivers that you're going to be staring at on day two are pretty darn good versus the tackles you're going to be staring at. You're going to be like, eh. Or, you know, and they look, they need interior players. And they say, we've got Pipkins. And I'm like, I don't dislike Pipkins. I, Pipkins has had some good and had some bad. He was trending up last year. He came back down a little bit. But the, this team couldn't run the football. And it wasn't just mm-hmm. because, you know, whatever was in the running back room and Austin Eckler wasn't healthy and, and all that. It was not a, a super physical team. If you go out and you get one of these linemen, whether it's sticking and picking with Joel, whether it's trading down and you get uh, Fuaga, who's plug and play uh, at right tackle. And if you wanted to play him at guard for a year, he could do that as well. Mm-hmm. Right? That fits this new core philosophy belief of this new version of the chargers and every time they post another video on social media whether it's herbert the strength coach whether it's the offensive line coach whether it's the gm whether it's the head coach offensive line offensive line offensive line offensive line that's where i that's where i am there just just you're gonna you're gonna clip this you can clip this off and that and then i'll have more angry charger fans at me well, saying, no hey, I, it's Marvin harrison and i'm like i <laughs> Any other any other time, any other team, I would I'm in. This is a unique situation. You're saying the exact same thing EJ said to me last week. Cause I was I was wavering and I was like we, we had Matt Harmon on. And I was like, I don't I I think they could go Marvin and EJ's like, listen to what they're saying. Just listen to them talk. They're telling you what they're gonna do. And it's and sometimes, and we all need to be wary of this, we know we are deep in smoke and mirror season. But with the Chargers, I'm with you. It's unique. It's different. They are saying it like a drumbeat. Every single time, every single chance they get, they're saying the same thing. We want to be tougher. We want to be stronger. We want to be able to set the tone. Sorry, I don't care which wide receiver you pick. They're not doing that, right? That's not their job. Can I Can I give you the perfect scenario? Like if sure. you said, how could you script it for what sure. they want to do and who they want to be? This is my script. You're picking at five. Um, the Chicago Bears, somehow you get the four quarterbacks that go, right? So you don't have a quarterback trade on your hands, but you do have Marvin staring you in the face. The Bears want to have their home run Houston Texans draft where they got two pillars last year. They trade up to get their two pillars with Caleb. They come up and they take Marvin. So now the Chargers are picking at nine, but they don't pick at nine because now you're going to get a call as teams pegging the Jets maybe as a Bowers team or a tackle Mm -hmm. team. Maybe you get a team like the Colts who come up from 15 to get ahead of the Jets. Now the Chargers have gone to nine. Then they've gone to 15. Then Mm. they take Graham Barton at 15, and they've got a treasure trove of picks. They plug and play him at center, and you've got a positional, flexible guy who can play all five spots, and you've got a boatload of picks to go solve all these other issues that you have. See, I agree with that. But I know any Chargers fans that watch this are going to say, DJ, that sounds amazing. However, can we just change that pick to A.D. Mitchell? Then you got me. We know they're not going to do it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, they're going to want to wind up. But to me, again, what, what's the number here? So they're going to I, they're going to come out of this draft with an interior offensive lineman at some point in time. They have to. And there's a lot of good ones. It's not a bad draft to need that. Pick 37. Frazier, you got a chance at Frazier. I think Oregon's Ooh. gone. I know Duke's gone. Um, yeah. So you've got a chance at one there. But there's intriguing guys. Like I could look at their needs 
I could say you get down to if they could get to like ten to fifteen, and you come out with either like a a Mitchell or a Terry and Arnold. Boom, we've plugged that hole. We come mm-hmm. out of that. Byron Murphy would look really good along that defensive front. We get him somewhere between ten and fifteen. Like then you've got Graham Barton who starts day one at center, who can you know is going to get coached by some really good offensive line coaches they have there, including Nick Hardwick, who's an absolute stud. So mm-hmm. like he'd be positioned to be successful. I. The good thing and the bad thing this time of year when you've got a lot of needs, you got a lot of options. Uh, unfortunately, yep. yes. <laughs> on, on all accounts. By the uh, way, DJ, my, any... my grade book every year, like I use different books, but I, I usually try and watch some tape on the charger flights when I'm traveling, and I forgot my book. So I went up to Telesco's office, and I'm like, dude, I got to watch some tape on this flight. He give me some, so... It's like when I'm like at, at league stuff, like this is my is my grade book. I'm like, what I can't I can't even pull this out on a flight. Like people are gonna crush me and just be like, oh he's a homer. Look at that. Wait, what is he doing? He's working for the Chargers. I work for the team, guys. <laughs> because they don't care. They don't care. Chiefs fans don't care. Although they've Chiefs got nothing to be upset. They've got nothing to be upset about, so they're good. I, I go on KC Sports Network all the time, and and uh, they you, they used to love me over there because I would talk positively about them, and now I'm just the enemy. You're the enemy, no man. Or what? Yeah. It's like, guys, you won two Super Bowls in a row. Life's good. Oh, <laughs> Chill yeah. out, just a little bit. Mitch, Mitch Holt is ain't worrying about us. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> hey, uh, just calling championships. That's all. Uh, EJ, you got any closing remarks before we get out of here? I just. This is a dream come true, especially this time of year. Everybody's busy. DJ, can't thank you enough for coming on, for sort of opening up the mental notebook about players, about process, about, you know, how you see it and what you've seen along the way, because you've seen more than most. And I just think it's incredibly valuable for us, for our listeners. Can't thank you enough. Well, dude, it was fun. I enjoyed it. The time flew by. You guys, um, have helped make people smarter through all the stuff that you do. So I'm, I'm all for it, man. Congratulations on all your guys' success. Um, I mean, EJ, if we can get you a fake back backdrop, like the one that Brett's got right now, you know, this, know. this little fake city view that he's got there, some <laughs> right. wallpaper, uh, then, you're, then we're really cooking with gas. Absolutely. Uh, Just make sure when you're up in Detroit, Get a good night's sleep. It's a long haul. A lot of TV to do. We do 17, 18 hours. You do even more than than us. So if we're exhausted by the end, I can only imagine how you feel. I have one goal this year for the draft. One goal and one goal only. Last year, I got peed on by a puppy uh, when we were trying to get some puppies adopted. <laughs> Don't get peed on this year. That's it. That's it. That's a successful three-day draft event. If I don't have to throw away a shirt and smell like puppy urine for the entire sixth and seventh round, that's a win. Well, I, I live with two cats who love nothing more than to pee on everything. So we'll we'll see. We'll see how far I get in the We each have our goals in life, buddy. <laughs> uh, DJ, can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, good luck in Detroit. Uh, also, uh, my friends at Mercer were very upset to hear that that you're that you have a kid who might be going to Samford. So yeah. let's let's stop by Mercer on the way, shall we? Okay. Okay. We'll make that happen. 